You're listening to Ricky and Jimmy on Relationships, the show where we uncover the thoughts and behaviors that are sabotaging your relationship and what you can do about it. Jimmy and I are passionate about sharing the ways that imperfect partners like you and I can shift unhealthy relational dynamics and create closeness. So welcome, drop your defenses and open your heart, eyes, and ears. Let's learn how to be the best partner we can be together. All right. Well, welcome to Ricky and Jimmy on Relationships. This is episode number two. They let us back for one more, Ricky. Can you believe it? <laughs> um, we are so it. excited to have you guys today. Today, we're talking about something that absolutely makes or breaks your relationship, and that's dealing with conflict, specifically turning conflict into closeness, if that's possible, because it that's our is. goal. We want to give you the tools to navigate those tricky areas of your relationship. And conflict, if not dealt with properly, can be extremely damaging to your relationships. Yeah, Jimmy, have you have you heard the Gottman study um, that they were able to predict divorce with an over 90% accuracy based on four very damaging behaviors that we're going to cover? I have heard, the four today. horsemen. You have, the four horsemen. We Everybody loves the four horsemen. If you're not familiar with them, buckle up. You are in for a treat because if, if you're doing this, you're sinking your ship and we don't want that for you. We were sinking our ships. Absolutely. We want to tell you not how not to. Yes. We want to tell you why, why we do the destructive things that we do, especially during conflict. Um, mm-hmm. And then what is the antidote for those things? What to do instead that actually mm-hmm. leads to closeness. So quickly, let's all get on the same page. What in your definition or in your perspective, what, what, what even is conflict? Yeah, that's such a good question. Cause I think when people talk about conflict, they just think about these like like massive fights and a conflict isn't necessarily a yelling screaming fight it's just a difference in needs or values or perspectives um, and that happens all the time you don't even have to look in a room and see two people angry at each other in order for there to be a conflict there can be conflict when one person walks into a room alone and there's dirty laundry everywhere and it upsets the other partner that's a conflict with one yes. person standing alone in a room yeah and I'm not sure if this is true about you. I think it is. But mm. for me, it, I was extremely conflict avoidant. Was that the case for you? Mm. I, I was the queen of conflict avoidance. Yeah. yeah. In my mind, conflict was bad, mm-hmm. naturally. Yes. And, so, and to be avoided at all costs. To be costs. avoided at all costs. Why <laughs> wouldn't you want to avoid conflict? So right. talk, talk to us a little bit about why that's actually the opposite that conflict is a normal and natural part of our relationship yeah i um i lived for 12 years in a relationship where um we both avoided conflict like the plague and um the trouble with that is that uh when things really matter to you the the big differences that naturally arise in a relationship with two very different people nothing gets solved and that's when resentment starts building up. And resentment is another one of the things that the Gottmans found to be a big predictor of divorce. Yeah. Uh, resentment itself creates disconnection. Absolutely. And that's really at the heart of the problem is conflict is natural and mm-hmm. healthy. Um, mm-hmm. But the way we handle it either leads to a reconnection or a mm-hmm. furthering disconnection. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um and the problem for me when I was con- when I was avoiding conflict is um, I wasn't really I wasn't really showing up in that relationship because mm-hmm. because I felt things that I wasn't sharing. Be- yeah. Because for a number of different reasons, sometimes people they don't want to share because they they're just scared that it's going to end in a fight or they mm-hmm. don't feel like the other person cares. Um, mm-hmm. Or maybe, yeah, like our needs aren't as important anyway. That's, I know that was a big feeling for me. If you're a people pleaser, you feel like I'll just default to the way that they, Mm -hmm. whatever they need, I'll just default to serving and giving and, and yeah, doesn't that feel safe? Didn't it? Right. (laughs) It's not, but it sure felt that way. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the reason it feels that way is because we don't know that there's another option. We don't know that there's a better mm-hmm. option. Well said. So we just default to what feels natural. Or- yeah. So back to your back to your question there, why conflict is actually a good thing. Um, when we are able to have differences and address them with each other in a loving, respectful manner, 
it actually creates closeness. That's exactly what intimacy is. Yes. You have a relationship with two different people who have totally different thoughts and needs and feelings in their mind. When we can connect on that, um, that's, that's what it makes everything safe. It makes it safe to have a difference of opinions. It makes it safe to have a difference of needs. Yeah, because you will. You will have differences of needs, obviously. Everyone will. Everyone and will. if you mm -hmm. truly, I don't want to single anyone out, but when you when you truly love another person, mm -hmm. you figure out how to navigate the differences between each of your needs. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. Yeah. yeah. And so that's part of we should want our partners to show up as their authentic selves. Yeah. If you're feeling and something. I do. I, I'm sure you do, uh, yeah. too. Absolutely. I want to know when my partner is bothered by something or yes. needs something that he doesn't feel is happening in the relationship. And there's a lot of people out there that say, yeah, but my that's not my partner. I don't I've feel like too. my partner. Yeah, um, I've heard that, too. And we want to empathize with that. That is a That is a very rough spot to be, and it puts you in quite a quite a bad spot when you don't feel like your partner truly cares if you're hurt. Mm -hmm. But mm. at the end of the day, we have to remember that that isn't actually a partnership. That's not. That's true. That's so, true. If uh, that's yeah. an important, I think that's yeah. an important thing for us to say right out of the gate here, that yeah. if you are truly with someone who genuinely does not care about your pain or the things that you want and need, it's not a partnership. No. And that's that it's okay to leave relationships like that. Yeah. But and, it, and it's not easy. It's certainly not easy. But here's yes. the caveat. I think yes, if yes. somebody lo loves you and seems to want to be with you, they do want you to be happy. They might just not know how to go about making that happen. I couldn't agree more. And the mm -hmm. other thing I wanted to say before we start is that um, anything that we say, we're going to talk about some destructive behaviors that um, Ricky and I have both been guilty of. Absolutely. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes personally, I will still default to some mm -hmm. some destructive behaviors during conflict. Um, mm -hmm. So the goal isn't being perfect. The goal is growth and maturity mm -hmm. and self reflection and, and accountability and accountability. Yeah, huge. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I just wanted everyone to know that you know we still make mistakes um we're just on a path towards self-reflection and emotional maturity and accountability and, yes. and learning how to repair and reconnect after those because that is essentially what turns conflict into closeness totally end, jimmy and i are fellow travelers in this yes. journey right there with you yeah so before we start before we launch into let's just go over some quick I want everyone to have these things in the back of their mind as we talk. The goal of conflict resolution is understanding and emotional safety. Underneath all of our most heated conflicts are needs that are going unmet. Mm -hmm. Every heated conflict is a result of some form of emotional disconnection. So when we see it through that lens, we can we can better empathize and understand with what our partner's going through. So having Very that in well mind, said. let's yes. launch into the first um, destructive habit that Gottman references, which is criticism. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about what criticism is, why it's happening? I love that. I'll take that, Jimmy. Criticism is a personal attack. Um, it's not when we see the the sink full of dishes and we're upset about the dishes and we talk about that specifically. Criticism is when we see a sink full of dishes and we point at our partner and we say, you are so lazy. That's yeah. criticism is when we're attacking the person and not the behavior. Perfectly said. Why um, do you think a partner defaults to criticism? I think a, de a partner defaults to criticism. One, because they don't, no one told them what it is. Um, mm -hmm. No one told them how destructive it can be in the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe they have the tools, the proper tools to communicate. They've, they kind of have never really been modeled or taught. This yeah. is how you should do it instead. But at the heart of it, I would criticize because <laughs> I was desperate to be seen and heard. I was desperate and, to be wow. understood. Even yeah. hearing that, I think of my own partner and I know that that's what's going on for him. If he's pointing at the sink and he's telling me that I'm lazy, it's him It's him saying there's a need that I have here that feels so big that I'm just yeah. exploding with the, I, I feel like I have a need that she is completely ignoring. And I, yeah, yeah. that desperation to be seen and heard. And, and thinking of it that way, it diffuses things a little bit for me when I imagine him having a need that he really wants to talk about, but doesn't know how that makes it easier for me to not feel so defensive. 
Mm-hmm. I tried to finish um, nonviolent communication. I got three fourths of the way through, and then <laughs> and then I swear to you, one of my children like picked up the book and lost it. So now it's like hidden oh, in the house no. somewhere. Oh <laughs> so, no! So I'm three fourths of the way through nonviolent communication. But but um, mm-hmm. as you will remember, he talks a lot about seeing almost everything, but especially conflict through the lens of needs. What mm-hmm. is this person needing? And I swear, I have adopted that during any conflict that Emily and I have. I'm not trying to tell myself as a great husband. I have plenty of mistakes. Sure. I make plenty of mistakes. But anytime she's upset about something, I always try to pause in my head mm-hmm. and think about two questions. What is she feeling? Maybe mm-hmm. three questions. What is she feeling? <laughs> what led to her feeling that way? Mm-hmm. And what does she need? That's and if fantastic. I can ans- if I can answer those three questions in my head, mm-hmm. it diffuses a lot of the tension in the conflict because I will sometimes I don't know the answer so I need to ask mm-hmm. and what mm-hmm. what happens That's when it you're, too. you know, yeah you can ask them directly I do cuz I have trouble yeah. feeling out what he really needs in our conflicts and sometimes I'll stop and I'll actually say what are what are you needing here I'm I want sure. to know what you need and yeah. that kind of stops him too because it kind of kind of shakes him and wakes him up to the fact that it's not it's not me that's the problem. It's the behavior and a need that he has. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and so so I think that curiosity, we'll probably talk more about how curiosity impacts our conflicts, but just mm-hmm. that genuine curiosity of, I want to know what you're feeling. I want to know what led to you feeling that way. And mm-hmm. I want to- And you know what, Jimmy? Yeah. You've just touched on um, the Gottman's antidote to that first horseman criticism. The okay. antidote is the gentle startup. Um, rather than someone coming in guns blazing, uh, we start yes. by talking about our feelings and their feelings in a gentle and calm way. That That yeah. is a criticism diffuser. I remember reading in one of the Gottman books um, that, and I'm probably going to quote this wrong, so you know, sorry. <laughs> we won't hold you sorry, to God, it. Sorry, Gottmans, not that they're <laughs> listening. Um, <laughs> but they said the first few minutes of a conversation mm-hmm. um, almost 95% of the time predict the outcome, like, or predict the, wow, if really? the conversation starts off heated or, you mm-hmm. know, uh, accusatory or yeah. critical, um, 95% of the time that conversation is not going to end well because w- mm-hmm. how, the way you start matters. Mm-hmm. Um, so that gentle startup absolutely touches on that. I think that it's so important too that, like you said, instead of being, instead of criticizing, mm-hmm. we we speak of a specific behavior and we take accountability for our own feelings. You already mentioned that, but it's, it's so important that we don't blame them. Now, just because we don't blame them doesn't mean they won't still feel unfairly attacked, but that's not our, sure. that's not our place um, to judge. The only thing that we can do is come and say, um, talk about specific things that happened as facts. When this happened, mm-hmm. um, I'm feeling this. Mm-hmm. That's all we can mm-hmm. do at the end and, of the day. Um, if you're listening and you're the partner who is is getting criticized more often, uh, one thing that helps me as the more often criticized partner is I make sure to let my partner know exactly how that makes me feel. Not in a not in an accusatory way. I'm not turning around, going the things that you're saying are you're a jerk for saying that. I'm not doing that, but I am letting you know, like, hey, when when you tell me you're lazy, that feels like a personal attack and it really hurts. And I know you don't want to hurt me. So let's, right. so let's find a different way to talk about this. And, yeah. and I, sometimes it's important, I think, to wake, to wake our partners up to the fact that their words can hurt if they're using them without, can, without careful consideration. Absolutely. The other thing I wanted to mention is, um, I was not good at this and I want other people to not make the same mistakes <laughs> as I did, but the Gottmans talk a lot about flooding. When you mm, get into a heated, yeah. when you get into a heated conflict, there is a high likelihood that one or both of you will become flooded. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know their exact definition of flooded, but we know, we all know that feeling where it just feels like steam is coming out of our ears. It feels yeah. like our blood is boiling. It feels like we're saying things that we haven't necessarily thought about. Or just to yeah. add, flooding can also look like a complete shutdown. I've Absolutely. had partners. I've had partners who would literally like curl up into themselves and hide their faces. Yeah, just an, and, a complete inability to even engage in the situation. 
And it's so important that we all think about when stuff like that happens, we have to pause. We have to be mature Mm -hmm. enough to be able to pause that discussion and say, you know what? Um, I'm noticing that I'm, I'm, I'm flooded. I'm out of line. Like I'm, I'm, I'm saying things that I don't mean. Um, can we take a break? Uh, yeah. The that can a lot be about... so, so challenging, so challenging for us people pleasers who want to fix it now, get the good feelings back right this second. But honestly, yeah. um, no conflict and situation is going to be solved from a place where one or both partners is absolutely losing it. Or so true. I mean, our, so um, the prefrontal cortex is, is shut down in those situations. You're not even making rational, logical thoughts in those times. Right. So two quick points on that is, is mm-hmm. set, set a time limit. Um, Excellent. But, yeah. But it, but if it's later in the day, it can absolutely be tomorrow. You do not need yeah. to come back to this immediately. Yes. Let's, um, let's right now have a moment of silence for the don't go to sleep angry <laughs> comment. Cause I'm laying that to rest. That's the worst advice ever. If, if two yeah. people are too angry to engage, you absolutely can sleep on it and start it up again in the yep. morning. Absolutely. So it's very important for the person that decides to take the break. Um, it's very important to say, um, this conversation still matters to me. And I know that, and I know that this might not be easy for you, Mm -hmm. but I would like to come back to this at X time. Hey, because it's important to me because it's important to to me as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other, the last thing I want to say on, on, um, kind of like how the antidote to criticism creates closeness and really how all of our antidotes create closeness is, is a quote from, um, Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. John Gray. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I loved everything about the book, but I love. <laughs> but it's a classic I, for a reason. It's a classic, it's, and I love this this quote. I want us to all think about this. Um, the success of a relationship is solely dependent on two factors: a man's ability to listen lovingly and mm-hmm. respectfully to a woman's feelings, and the woman's ability to share her feelings in a loving and respectful way. A relationship requires both partners communicate their changing feelings and needs, and we've talked about that. But I it's so it. important. And, the, and, and just to bring it up to the, to the 21st century here, um, let's say that uh, it's dependent on a partner's ability to Couldn't share more. their Couldn't feelings more. and the other partner's ability to listen. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Because um, it all hangs on how we express, but also on how they receive. It takes mm-hmm. two in this equation. Um, I always I like to say in my videos that intimacy can't be cultivated alone. I mean, oh, you that's need, a good one. You need two yeah. partners, and this is one of the major ways that we can create and cultivate closeness is by um, owning our side of the street when it comes to how we express, but also they have to show up in the way that they receive. And they, you know, um, it's our job not to blame, but it's also their job to listen, to understand, and not to dismiss and all that stuff. I so, love it. Hey, I know. think that's a good... Um a good place to lead to the next horseman yes. uh, because Contempt. sometimes, oh, yeah, that's okay. Contempt. It's the next one. Uh, sometimes it feels like, especially if we feel like we're the partner who's the only one doing work, it can be easy to accidentally slip into, into contempt, which is the, um, the contempt is the feeling that you are superior to yes. your partner. And it's so funny to think um, that I was so guilty of that when I thought, I'm the only one doing any work here. I had no idea that that was actually a contemptuous attitude toward my partner, a holier than thou, I'm better than them doing more. It's a tough one. It's so tough. And and most people, if not all people, um, Mm -hmm. don't think they're guilty of it. We, none Mm -hmm. of us think we're guilty of contempt. (laughs) No, it's a tough one to own up to. Yeah. And yet, um, the Gottman say that it is it is the single greatest predictor of divorce. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. I believe um, that without yeah. without respect, we don't we don't have a healthy relationship. And that and you just you said is. such a key yeah. word is how how it's the opposite of respect. Um, mm-hmm. It's not respectful when we are insulting them mm-hmm. or name calling them or being sarcastic when they're hurt um, mm-hmm. or demeaning them. It's it's prideful and mm-hmm. um, it's a it's a it's a we think we're superior to them in a way. Yeah. And, um, that can be, it can feel like such a tough one to work on too, especially if, I mean, I I really feel for you if you're the partner 
who's sitting there going, ah, oh, my partner is so contemptuous. They right. think that they're so much better than me. And I, man, that's tough. Because how do you break through that? You know, you can't. I mean, I mean, it's very difficult. <laughs> it's, it's very it's, difficult. I think yeah. I think all of these, there's something that you can do about it. But that that yeah. is a really tough one. If you've got a partner who's yeah, who and we just have to remember that there is something that we can do. We can mm -hmm. show up, we can show up and take care, take accountability for our side of the street. But we have to I think it's very important because I get a lot of comments that are at the at the core of their comment. It's mm -hmm. yeah, but how can I get him to hear me? How can I mm -hmm. get him? Mm -hmm. What what can I say? How can I get him? I mean, I say him because the majority of my comments are from women, but mm -hmm. but it can be the other way around. How can I get her to understand, or how can I get her to care? We yeah. have to remember that literally all we can do is show up and um, practice vulnerability in sharing. But like we just said earlier, it, it takes two for this thing to truly turn into closeness. So, so don't get yeah. caught up in like, well, maybe if I just, maybe if I just said the right words, no, mm -hmm. not always. Sometimes, sometimes you need to establish healthy boundaries, which we'll talk mm -hmm. about later. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Um, contempt though, uh, the Gottmans, thank goodness have left us with an antidote to contempt yes, and that's what it building is. a culture of appreciation. Um, reminding yourself of your partner's positive qualities and finding gratitude for positive actions. And I got to say, um, as, um, as I said, I, I believe that, um, contempt is, is my, my partner's horseman that he struggles with. It's another one that's tough for him. And when I work hard on building a culture of appreciation, making sure to, always notice the good mm. things that he's doing and point them out and thank him for that. Uh, the contempt goes way down, way, mm. way, way down. So I wonder if that might mean too, that a very contemptuous partner is one that doesn't feel seen. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that that is absolutely a reason why that's happening. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I w I'm not smart enough to go into the psychology behind it, but it could be. <laughs> But there could be a there could be some projecting there where yeah there, absolutely um, but and, and not to mention um, a, a word that we haven't mentioned but but a word that is prevalent through so much of this is insecurity a mm -hmm. lot of this mm -hmm. a lot of this stems from our own insecurities and that's part of the antidotes that we'll go through with all of these really boils down to um, a self reflection and an emotional maturity of learning about that stuff. Like, what am I actually mm -hmm. fear? What am I fearful of? And what am mm -hmm. I, what am I, where are my insecurities and stuff like that? Working on that yeah. stuff. Let's talk about the next horseman, which is defensiveness. Ooh, Jimmy, this is my horseman. If I, well, if I'm I was let like, you take it then. <laughs> yeah. If I was like best friends with any of the horsemen, me, me and defensiveness would yeah. be BFFs for sure. Um, defensive, Defensive folks are victimizing themselves to ward yes. off attacks. And um, another favorite move of mine as a very defensive person is uh, reversing the blame. So when I feel attacked for something, my go-to move would be like, yeah, but you, that's that's where I would go with that. Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's very, very hard for defensive people to sit with the idea that they've done something wrong. That's what it was for me. The idea, um, and this is really tough for people pleasers too, which I struggled with a lot. Um, the idea that I did something wrong, or that I upset someone, that an action that I did made me look less than lovable in some way, I, I couldn't handle it. And if somebody throws you a hot potato that you can't handle, you toss it right back at them. That's Absolutely. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I tend to see it as... Uh, Sometimes when I'm defensive, it's because I'm scared to be seen in a, in a negative light. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm, I'm scared mm -hmm. to be seen as a failure, maybe. Yeah. Um, there's probably a lot of men that would resonate with that if they really, if they mm -hmm. really looked into their last conflict. Okay, but why did I get so defensive? Why did I, you know, why yeah. did I turn it around and blame it? Why did I turn around and immediately not take, you know, any accountability and try to blame the other person? Um mm -hmm. It's because I was I was scared to be seen as a failure, or I, or I felt like they were. Here's a here's a huge problem. Um, mm -hmm. I felt like they were calling me a failure, but oh, but really, yeah. they weren't. Yeah, they were. They were simply. Um, they were simply speaking about how they were feeling. 
Mm-hmm. You know, well, so, sometimes it can. If our partner has a need that's not being fulfilled in some way, we can turn that we can turn that inward and feel like a failure for not yes. helping them out with those needs. Yeah, defensiveness arises. That's absolutely true. So let's talk about what to do instead. Yeah, of, I want to of- say this is probably also my favorite antidote um, because it's probably the thing that I've been working on the most for the last few years, and the Gottmans antidote to defensiveness is taking responsibility, Um, accepting your partner's perspective, which can be very tough, uh, but we have to try to take our pride and our fear out of things and just ask ourselves, what is my partner's perspective? And offering them an apology for wrongdoing that we have to accept that we did. Uh, The way to go about this too, something that's been very helpful for me, is to remember that I can do something that's bad and not be bad. It's the difference. Uh, they so talk true. a lot in therapy about the difference between oh, guilt and wait, shame. Guilt and shame. Exactly. You knew where I was going with that. Thank you, Jimmy. I'm a um, good. I'm a good yes, co-host. Guilt. Yeah, exactly. Guilt is I did something wrong and I feel bad about it. But shame is. I am wrong. I am bad. It's just like it, it is who I am at my core. Then that's that's what we're trying to escape from. Um, when your partner voices an upset or a hurt that they have, our ability to take ourselves out of that shameful place is key so that we can sit in a in a in a place of guilt rather than shame. Yeah. Um, And it's a good thing to feel guilty when we do something wrong. When I leave the sink completely full of smelly dishes, which I do on occasion, um, it's okay for me to feel guilty about that because I have done something that's inconvenienced my partner. Um, So guilt is an okay okay place to go with that. Shame, where I start accusing myself of being a terrible partner or turning it right back around on him, uh, that's a much less helpful place to be. And it also doesn't help my partner feel feel seen and heard. So what one thing that I wanted to mention about defensiveness is um, it's so difficult for me to take responsibility in that moment, but it's, 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 really, it's just really so important. And what we're not advocating for, what I'm not advocating for is to, mm-hmm. to apologize for things that you didn't do. That's not what I want you to no. do. But no. I think part of this is kind of seeing how, seeing, seeing our role. So mm-hmm. if Emily's upset about something, if I, if I made her do the dishes for, mm-hmm. you know, the last five nights in a row and she's mm-hmm. like, Hey, I just feel a little bit abandoned when it comes to mutual chores. And mm-hmm. I immediately launch into defensiveness, which is, Oh, Please, I go to work for forty hours a week. I, I don't know why. Why are you always right. bringing this up? Why do you know, like uh, like I'm the bad guy? Why do you need to make Why do you need to make such a big deal about nothing? Mm-hmm. I'm not taking responsibility for anything, and mm-hmm. because I have a level of superiority, why do I? What you're, you're what you're bringing up is I'm I'm being unfairly blamed, mm-hmm. and so I need to defend. I need to mm-hmm. defend myself. Um, the problem with that is that it one. It doesn't lead to her feeling like she's allowed to bring up a complaint without getting Mm. chastised and attacked. It doesn't lead to any closeness. Mm -mm. Um, It's not focusing on any sort of understanding of what she's actually feeling because Mm -hmm. maybe she didn't come to me and just, and directly express her feelings. Maybe she just said, maybe she just said, I'm tired of doing all these dishes every day. Well, yeah. Okay, so those are the three questions that I have to ask in my head when she does that. Instead of getting defensive, okay, mm-hmm. what is she feeling? Because I'm tired of doing the dishes. She doesn't just mm-hmm. feel tired. So what is she mm-hmm. actually feeling? And then I can say, oh, okay, it seems like something's it seems like something's wrong. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're feeling? Mm-hmm. And that immediately diffuses. Now she doesn't need to escalate the conversation. She doesn't need to get critical to get my attention. She has my attention. I'm that's I'm a here. great I'm point. Present. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. When when we can help our partners to feel seen and understood, things don't escalate. They, they don't. don't escalate. Not as much, at least. Not um, as much. I guess it's, other, it's still possible. It's a little bit, but the it's other manageable. thing that I try to do is. Um, listening without interrupting that's huge i mean that's that's absolutely huge and then we talked about getting curious about what they're needing from us instead of just focusing on the blame yeah. and what we're feeling what we're interpreting as um, an attack on us so remember we don't have to agree 
with their feelings or perspectives mm -hmm. to ascribe value to them and say, these are important to us. You're, what you're feeling and what your perspective is, is important to me. I think that's key right there to bring it right back to the dishes. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes I don't feel the urgency that he does to get all the dishes out of the sink. So sometimes when I, when I'm, when I feel that he's accusing me of that, I'm like, in my brain, I'm like, what's the big deal, right? They've only, I mean, there's yeah. still food on the table. I'm not cleaning all these dishes up immediately. So in my mind, that would be me saying like, I feel like I'm being blamed unfairly here. But instead of bringing that up, um, it's much more effective for me to see and acknowledge his pain. Like, like if, if I can turn around with a, ah, I know that these dishes really bug you and I, I don't want that for you. I mean, if, if I can say things that make him feel seen and understood and, yes. and important, um, and that then doesn't, that doesn't Sorry. say, oh, you're right. I'm terrible for not doing the dishes. Right. <laughs> That's, exactly. It's just, I, kn I know that that bothers you and I don't yeah. want that for you. Because in a partnership, we're always trying to work together. I mean, this mm -hmm. is this is just a this is something that this is another way that we work together and we we compromise together and we talk about what 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 we're needing in that in that situation and going forward. And mm -hmm. and when you care about your partner and when you love them, mm -hmm. you you attempt to do that. In the, at least in the best relation, if you want a great relationship, that's exactly. what you need to attempt to do. Um, yeah. All right, so this has been pretty heavy. I, I have a funny story for you. I'm ready for it. I want Let's to lighten it up. This is 100% true. I didn't make this up. This is <laughs> this is something that happened to me this week. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to rename the people um, Janet and Jack, okay? Excellent. So I get an email from Janet, and she's like, mm -hmm. she tells me, she uh, I get emails frequently about, I'm grateful people say, hey, do you do coaching? Will you help me? You know, will you help me and my husband? Awesome. I say, ooh, I say, ooh, I'm not actually a coach. I'm not a coach or a counselor. I'm so sorry. Uh -huh. um, I'm just a husband who wants to learn how to be a better husband. Right. Okay. Anyways, so she her she put her phone number in in the thing, and for some reason, instead of emailing her back, I texted her that. I said, oh, I'm not a coach or counselor, but oh. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry what's going on in your in your marriage, but um, I hope that you can get the help that you need. But you know, I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not available for that. And, and then she goes, um, I said, well, if there's anything else I can do, let me know. She said, well, a little bit of money would help. <laughs> oh, okay. wow. What? Okay, now hold what? On. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Rec record scratch. Wait a second. <laughs> so, so That's no not where joke. I was expecting that to go. <laughs> right? So I'm a little bit taken aback, but, mm -hmm. but I'm like, now listen, if you're, a if you're a listener to this, I swear to you, if you ask me for money, I'm not going to give you any money. <laughs> Especially oh not after yeah. this story, but yeah. there occasionally I do have a little soft spot in my heart, and I think to mm -hmm. myself, people don't ask me for money very often. So when people do, mm -hmm. I think to myself, you know what? Maybe you should be generous. Like people don't ask you very often, so when they oh, do, really? maybe you should do that. So, anyways, so I said, so I said, <laughs> I said, all right, well, um, I, just to see what she wanted to say, I said, well, how much do you, how much do you want? Like I don't even have, I don't even have. Oh, that much wow. money you really, you kept going. I just with wanted it, to see right? what they would. I just yeah. wanted to see what she would say. So. <laughs> Luckily, she said anything would help. So then that made me feel like, okay, maybe maybe this is genuine. Like maybe she just anything would help. Huh. So okay. So I so I sent her so I sent her a little money via electronic payment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Long story short, um, Janet emails me like three days later. Yeah. <laughs> it was like yesterday, actually. She emails me and she goes, "Did you get my email?" <laughs> uh huh. I'm like, "Yeah, I got your email. I sent you that money." And she's like, I, I didn't get any. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what? Wait, what? But there's, so wait, the, but wait, wait, wait. The yeah, phone yeah. number was in the email originally, exactly. wasn't it? So I go back to the I go back to the phone number and I uh -huh. text whoever I'm talking to. I go, so I guess you're not Janet. Yes. <laughs> okay. And he goes, no, my name is Jack. That's I'm amazing. Like, just a I'm rando. Like, just, yeah. oh my goodness. A literal, a literal rando. <laughs> I texted I, a rando. I'm sorry that your marriage is in trouble. Is there anything I can do to help? And that's he said, amazing. He said, and he's like, "Yeah, money. you can give me some money." That's Anyways, amazing. I know that was a long story. Here's <laughs> here's the crazy here's the crazy thing. Jack, he gave uh -huh. me the money back. He literally sent me you money. Stop. Really? He did. He was well, just messing amazing. with me the whole time. That's awesome. He goes. Okay, I, that, he goes. I've been waiting for you to been waiting for you to text me. <laughs> 
I'm like, Jack, don't mess around with me. That's not Oh fair. my okay. gosh. That's I wonder what the funny story on his end sounds like. He's like, Hey, oh just gosh. one day I just got this random yeah. text from some dude who was crazy. Giving- <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on to the final um the final horseman of from John Gottman, and that's stonewalling. Um Yes. Now if anyone and, doesn't um, know it yeah. I, Jimmy, I just want to say we had a great conversation earlier today. Um, I think it'd be fun to point out the difference between stonewalling and the silent treatment because they often get conflated. So first let's define, define stonewalling and then talk about what it isn't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I define stonewalling as withdrawing from the conversation. Um, if you Mm -hmm. think about someone, um, sometimes people withdraw physically, they just get up Mm -hmm. and leave and they Mm -hmm. won't talk to you. Other times they're still there, but they're not engaging they're not looking at you they almost act like they can't hear you they're yes. essentially sitting like a stone would mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. now why um here's here's why that's bad obviously because mm-hmm. it doesn't help anything as you can imagine it only leads to worsening disconnection and distance because mm-hmm. that person still doesn't feel heard they're not receiving they're i mean they're they're maybe they're expressing Maybe they're even expressing in a healthy way, but the other person is not receiving that. Yeah. So to them, what they're seeing is you don't care about my feelings, clearly, because yeah. you can't even be bothered to listen to them. It so, can be massively triggering, too. I massively think, triggering. Um, being stonewalled is one of my biggest triggers. There's no faster way to get me to go from zero to raging angry yeah. than being stonewalled. Tell me, me a little personally. bit about why you think... Because it seems so counterintuitive. Why would anyone do that? Yeah, um, I think uh, a lot of stonewalling is going to happen when individuals are flooded. I can remember trying to bring up a really serious um, hurt that I had with a partner. And he, I, I watched him curl into himself like a ball. And I truly thought that he was trying to block me out because he wanted to hurt my feelings. But now that I know what I know, I know that um, stonewalling individuals are often flooded. They're overwhelmed. They are unable to engage because um, everything in their brain is telling them seek safety. It's really important, I think, to point out uh, the difference here between stonewalling and the silent treatment. Um, if a partner is giving you the silent treatment, that's an intentional shutdown that they're they're doing to kind of get your goat. They know that if they turn into a stone wall, it's going to make you upset and maybe make you engage in a more fired up way that might feel more satisfying for them in the moment. Um, I've heard people say, I wanted to be sure that my partner was feeling something. So I did that in order to get some of that emotion out of them. And that's, um, that's not what we're talking about here um the stonewalling no. that the gottmans are referring to is talking about a, a, a physiological shutdown that happens when we feel overwhelmed yeah and back to the silent treatment real quick um mm-hmm. not that we're trying to not that we're judging or calling people out obviously we all have reasons why why we would give the silent treatment is like you said mm-hmm. we're we're desperate for them to come along. We're desperate for them to feel something. We're Mm -hmm. desperate for them to show up. Um, and it's, but we don't know how to do that. I mean, I know that when I personally have given the silent treatment, there's a, there's a part of me that it's almost a way to manipulate in a way, isn't it? It is for sure. It's some, and and I hate to say it, but sometimes it would feel kind of good. I hate to say that, but it felt kind of powerful to turn my phone off and purposely know, you know, this person yeah. is agonizing now because they can't get a hold of me. How does it feel? That's absolutely, um, yeah. And, it's and a why really are we? Un- why are we giving the silent treatment? Because we're hurt, and yeah, and we want them to, we want them to help bridge that that hurt. We want mm-hmm. we there's emotional disconnection, and we yeah. want there to be closeness. Yeah. But, but it's an don't... unhealthy way to go about it. For Absolutely, sure. an unhealthy way. It's an acting way. out and a manipulation. Very much true. But and potentially we don't know how to directly express those feelings. Um, yeah. Or we don't feel like they'll care. Or all that same stuff that we talked about mm-hmm. with why do we criticize? You know. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have a we have an antidote for the yes, stonewalling. For, for which one? Okay, for stonewalling. <laughs> for the stonewalling. Do we have an antidote for the silent treatment? Because that's probably. <laughs> 
they're all the same emotional maturity (laughs) self-reflection right right all the things that we should be doing um well anyway so if if you're in an argument and your partner is a stonewaller they shut down they transform into a stonewall in front of you um physiological self-soothing is what the gottmans recommend uh that would be taking a break and spending that time doing something soothing and distracting and when i say distracting i don't mean I don't mean hop on and play four hours of video games to distract yourself from what's going on. I just mean do something relaxing so that you're not sitting and ruminating over the argument for the next four hours, keeping yourself in that heightened, heightened, um, heightened place where your body's on alert. Um, yes. Something distracting might be a walk or a run. Something distracting might be cooking yourself a healthy meal so that you're focusing on that instead of the argument um, with the intention of coming back to things when when you feel more more calm down yeah Can but I jimmy add... here's a question what oh, if I'm your sorry. partner's the stonewaller what if your partner's the stonewaller oh so what should we do if the if our partner mm-hmm. is stonewalling i yeah. mean i think that we need to um here's what you should do if your partner if you if you're being stonewalled mm-hmm. yeah there um, if you're being stonewalled First, we calmly and vulnerably talk to them, not when they're flooded. Mm-hmm. In another in another situation, when things are going a little well, we talk to them about how that makes us feel and how that, in our opinion, oh, creates on. creates yeah. a lot of disconnection and it makes yeah. us it makes us feel very unheard and very unloved. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, like you would agree, a, a stonewaller is probably has an avoidant attachment. Would you agree? I think so. The stonewallers that I have encountered were avoidant attachments. Now, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And if that's true, then they're probably not very well connected with their own feelings and needs. Wow. Excellent. Yeah. It's, that's perfect. But we should, we, so when we talk to them about how, well, we don't feel very seen and heard, they, they probably don't really know how to do anything different. That doesn't justify what they're doing and it doesn't take away from its destructive pattern but, totally would but you like to know what yeah. what we do because i have an avoidant leaning partner who who stonewalling would be one of his horsemen for sure he sure. shuts right down when you mean what's the healthy start. thing to do yeah what's the healthy thing to do as Hit the me. partner of somebody yeah. who stonewalls um yeah. i am better at recognizing when chris is flooded than he is because i'm still there in the moment so when so i smart. see him yeah. shutting down i bring it to the to our attention to both of us i'll say it does not seem like you're in a good place to have this conversation right now that's so good and then i initiate the break and the distraction i love that Mm -hmm. um can i touch one more on a point that you mentioned earlier and i I absolutely loved this like i loved the way that you worded this but it but it made me think about something else Mm -hmm. we tend to point the finger especially when it comes to an avoidance spouse Mm -hmm. We tend to point the finger at our partner and we say, well, they're not doing enough to create emotional safety in this relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's true. They need to do more most of the time as we usually need to do more as well. But (laughs) you know what I never thought of? We want vulnerability from them. We want closeness from them. We want safety from them. Mm -hmm. But so often our avoidant partners don't actually feel safe giving those things. We yeah. forget that they don't actually feel safe giving vulnerability or mm-hmm. like we, we think it's so natural. Like they shouldn't have this type of reaction. Why, you know, why do they shut down? Why do they do this? But like mm-hmm. really, and I think, and you might be able to speak to this a little bit more from an attachment theory perspective, but like mm-hmm. they're running towards emotional safety as well. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Yeah, no, totally. Um, as the anxious partner, um, imagine Imagine being told that the thing that you need to do is give them space. Just give them space. You, I mean, when I say that, you know, as the more anxious partner, how scary that feels. Absolutely. Well, just initiate some disconnection. No big deal. So for the so yeah. for an avoidant leaning partner, telling them to just sit with a very uncomfortable conversation, that's the same level of terror for them. Telling so them to the, open up and talk yeah, about their fears when they don't and feel their ready vulnerability. Or they, yeah. 
That's terrifying for them. It's terrifying. Um, they get demonized for it a lot because it seems like they're doing that on purpose. But it's, yes. yeah, it's like asking an anxious attacher to just, just take a week for it by yourself. No big deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably why stonewalling is kind of a go-to behavior for more avoidant individuals because um, when they're faced with all these things, they're faced with the anxious partner who needs to talk about things right now, needs to resolve it right now, their whole body is overwhelmed and they just shut down. Yeah, I just wanted to make one quick point on accountability. Um, I didn't say this earlier and I wanted to say it, is it's easy for us to ascribe what's the word I'm trying to say? Um, it's easy for us to think to ourselves, well, we had to become critical to be heard, or we had to mm. get defensive, but we have to remember this is part of taking accountability for our side of the street. No one causes you to be critical. No one causes mm. you to be defensive. Um, no one it's causes you. It's a choice we make. It's yeah. a choice we make. Mm -hmm. um, no one is forcing you to be disrespectful or demeaning towards your partner. Even mm -hmm. Whenever we talk about why we might do certain destructive patterns, we have to always remember that the why doesn't justify anything. We It's still a choice that we have to make and it's still destructive. There's never a good, there's never a good reason to justify or to demean or to disrespect your partner. I wanted to launch really quickly in the few minutes that we have left um, with other destructive behaviors that both partners need to be on high alert for that Gottman didn't necessarily mention in the four horsemen, but these are, these will resonate with you and you will, you will um, quickly see, oh yeah, these definitely need to be talked about. And oh, the cool. first one is, I have a list here too. So oh, I'd like gosh. to chime in too after you've right. thrown some out. Perfect. So we have, the first one is um, <laughs> invalidation. I believe invalidation um, mm -hmm. can single-handedly destroy your relationship. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's what it's, a it's, bad dis one. it's dismissing mm -hmm. um, your partner's feelings or ignoring their experience or hurt. Mm -hmm. Um, invalidation could sound like just get over it. It's not a big deal. Mm, yeah. um, hey, I was just kidding. Why are you making such a big deal about this? Yeah. Absolutely. I was just kidding. Can't you take a joke? I mean, uh, Ugh, you're going yeah, to, you're going to get upset over that. I mean, you're so sensitive. I mean, you're overreacting mm -hmm. or you're crazy. I didn't yeah. mean it that way. So you shouldn't feel that way. Those are all examples of invalidation mm -hmm. and they do the mm -hmm. same thing that we talked about earlier, which is just perpetuate disconnection and distance in the relationship. Um, mm -hmm. I say if emotional safety is the foundation of a healthy, secure, trusting relationship, then invalidation mm -hmm. would be one of the best ways to just destroy and chip away at that foundation. Mm -hmm. So so let's let's riff on uh, our own antidote to that real quick, since the gods haven't included that one. I yeah. think that a great solution to invalidation would be to remind ourselves if we are an invalidator, um, that we can acknowledge our partner's feelings without agreeing with them. That's so true. And it, and it's extremely difficult. Sometimes. It's extremely difficult. It's not easy. But, I, but um, simply being quiet and listening to what they're saying and being able to repeat back to them the thing that they say that they're feeling or struggling with is incredibly validating. And that's not saying you're right or I'm wrong. Um, just making sure that they feel heard and seen is is key to validation. And like what you just said, repeating back to them what they mm -hmm. said, um, that that is so key to, to them feeling heard and understood. Mm -hmm. That is one of the best ways where we can bridge that emotional disconnection. And um, we can really communicate with our listening that you're not too much for me. Your feelings Fantastic. aren't too much for me. Yeah. Um, and that's really a key part into turning conflict into closeness. Mm -hmm. Let me throw um, one out. Yeah, please neglect. do that. Neglect. 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 I mean, unintentional neglect. <sighs> is unintentional neglect. Yeah. Because most people aren't intentionally neglecting you. I, I hope so. Yeah, I think I you're hope right so. on that. Some people are, but most <laughs> most of the time marriages, marriages will fail due to unintentional neglect. Yeah. I think the, the biggest antidote to that is um, people just, one, being open to talk about how they're actually feeling. It's yeah. very difficult to say, I feel neglected. It's very difficult. Ooh, that's really tough. But um, it, takes, it takes a lot of vulnerability. It takes a lot of bravery, too, to talk about the things that we need. And and being so able true. to talk about the things that we need in a nonviolent communication kind of way, um, yeah. is uh, that's a great antidote to neglect. Yeah. It absolutely is. And, and, and another way, um, I just made a video recently about, about talking, just sitting down mm -hmm. and simply asking the question, how do you feel loved most? I mean, how, Fantastic. Yeah. Or, yeah. or a second question is in what areas might you feel 
unintentionally neglected by me. I think oh, it, that I like takes that. that takes so much vulnerability. Ooh, but can you, yeah, because you, you got to be ready for that answer. You know, that answer might kind of sting a little bit. <laughs> and and that's the hallmark of a great partnership is mm-hmm. is the ability to say, you know what, like I'm willing to take that because. I care about you and I love you. And why wouldn't I want to know that information? So like, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Um, I love it. One one way that, uh, one way that I try to be, to not be an unintentionally neglectful partner is when I remember, I try to tell my partner, um, Hey, what's something that I can do for you today that will make you feel really loved. I try to ask him that frequently. I don't get it every single day, but I, I sure try to a lot. Can you imagine how wonderful mm-hmm. I know, I know listeners, anyone listening to this, that's something that we can all agree on, right? Like, wouldn't you love yeah. your partner to say that? Oh my gosh. Like, why, open it why up. is it so difficult? Why is it so difficult to have two yeah. people that are willing to ask those questions? <laughs> and, and at the heart of that, that's what you need to really wrestle with. Why is that so difficult? Or why yeah. is that so, why does that feel like such a far off pipe dream? Oh gosh, mm-hmm. if only my husband would ask that. He would mm-hmm. never ask that. Why? Why wouldn't you? Well, ask hey, it? let me throw some hope yeah. out for people that when Let's I started that. saying that with with a lot of regularity, he started saying it back to me. So wow, that helps. There is hope. Right? There is yeah, hope. There is hope. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to launch into real quick because we only have like five minutes left, and I want to talk about one aspect that we we cannot um, forget to talk about is apologies. When we when we're turning yes. conflict into closeness, we have to learn how to apologize. I had to learn mm-hmm. how to apologize. Nobody <laughs> teaches you this stuff. So let mm-hmm. me quickly go over um, one I already talked about earlier. I'm not saying apologize for things that that you didn't do. Um, but in a healthy, mature relationship, sometimes we do take accountability. Like, you know what? I have been neglecting the dishes. I did put that on you. You've been doing them without, I didn't like, you know, Nobody, we didn't have a conversation that said I was going to make you do the dishes for this whole week. So Mm -hmm. when we take some accountability and when our partner feels hurt, we should apologize. Um, Mm -hmm. So let me tell, let me go quickly go over what are, what are some common um, not apologies? Um, So (laughs) uh, some of the favorites. Um, Oh, I guess I'm always wrong. Oh, you're always, you're, I'm always the Mm. bad guy. Or how about this one? Um, Okay. I'm sorry if I hurt you. They don't, Ugh, which means, yeah. which means, which means they don't really have any intention to understand where this hurt is coming from. It's really just, let's get this over with. Okay. I'm sorry if I hurt you or, right, I'm, sorry right. if, or I'm sorry for whatever I did. Whatever. Yeah. I'm My personal favorite is I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> Ew. Yeah. Now some people, yeah. And this goes back to people potentially don't have the skills or tools to kind of dive into that a lot of a lot of Mm -hmm. men i don't want to speak on about fall men but a lot of men would say they don't even know how to like bridge that gap like Mm. they don't know how to say they don't know how to figure out what she's feeling you know it's very difficult for them it feels overwhelming but that's what we're here for we want to give you some tools um how about how about i said i was sorry can you get over it Ew, Um, yeah or how about this one one. this one is this one is (laughs) i think you mentioned this one earlier one um yeah but you do the same thing to me Oh yeah, that's me. That's a Ricky classic there. So <laughs> the last thing I want to say on apologies is there shouldn't be any buts in your apologies. And I don't mm-hmm. want you to apologize too quickly. Sometimes when we apologize too quickly, mm-hmm. we're really just trying to get out of the discussion. We're not actually, totally. we're not actually trying to understand them. We're not actually being curious. So I would always tell people don't apologize too quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, Jimmy, give us a really good, curious. a really yeah. good heartfelt apology. Okay. Do you want, like do you want me to insult one. you first? No, let's pretend okay. that you've insulted me and <laughs> let's skip to the good part. <laughs> okay. So the first part, <laughs> so uh, a really good apology would sound like this. Um, you mentioned earlier that when I was, um, when I made fun of you at the party, that you mm-hmm. felt disrespected. And I just want you to know that um, I'm really sorry. And I didn't, obviously I didn't intend for that to come across in a, you know, making fun of you way, but I can totally understand why you would feel hurt. That's and, fantastic. And I don't want to do that anymore. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I, I know that that didn't actually happen to us, but I felt that apology and I accept it wholeheartedly. Thank yeah. you. If I ever make fun of you at a party, <laughs> I'm going yeah. to know what to oh, say. Oh, you got it. Yeah. We know what we'll say. Um, um, let's, um, I, I want to, I want to take the last couple of minutes here to throw yeah. out a couple of books that have really helped me I in conflict that. as someone who is very conflict averse. Um, 
and I and I mentioned this in my own book, uh, which is full of resources for anxious attachers. Yeah, we'll the put a link ab- down in the um, description. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. Um, the absolute most helpful book that I read was called Difficult Conversations, How to Discuss What Matters Most. Um, It's by Douglas Stone, and it's just brilliant. That book for me made conflict not so terrifying. I mean, it still is uncomfortable, but I know that it's not terrifying now because I know ways to make conflict turn into closeness through Um, He talks a lot about assertiveness, and he talks a lot about goals and empathy. And it's just a great book for people who are terrified of conflict, like I was. Uh, The other fantastic one is called The Assertiveness Workbook. That one's by Randy Patterson. Um, That's going to be helpful if you are a passive communicator, like I was, or if your partner is an aggressive communicator, like many people that I've been with. Um, or passive aggressive. Um, If you're using any of those unhelpful things, this book talks about the fourth fantastic alternative to all of that, which is assertive communication. Mm. And And the book that we referenced Mm -hmm. probably a lot, I don't know, John Gutman has a lot of different books and he probably talks about the Four Horsemen and a lot of them, but one of Mm -hmm. them, the one book that I reference to people all the time is um, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. Oh, that's a classic. Yeah, that's great. So if you're new to the to the um, relationship book world and you want to start mm-hmm. out with some good ones. Those are fantastic. The other book mm-hmm. that Ricky and I love is Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson. Oh, so good. Yeah. yeah. And um, and Jimmy mentioned earlier, uh, Jimmy, you mentioned nonviolent communication yes, by Marshall by Rosenberg. 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 Yes. yes. It's super dry, but it's full of gems. So don't it's try to sit, yeah. read it all in one sitting, but nonviolent communication is great if you tend to be someone who kind of attacks with your with yeah. your requests. So hopefully we gave some people some good tools and to navigate conflict That's into the closeness. Goal. Um, yeah. But if you have any other questions, get um, hit us up in the comments. And yeah, don't miss, um, if, you're, if you're new to this too, if this happens to be your first episode, uh, Jimmy's TikTok is hilarious. It's oh, hilarious. So I love your TikTok page, Jimmy. Yes. So uh, you so that's much. where, yeah, head, head over there. If you're a TikToker, head over to Jimmy's, Jimmy's page to find some great relationship advice. Um, if you're, uh, want to diffuse the conflict that's happening in your marriage or relationship. Um, my, my own page on Instagram is, uh, mostly for anxious attachers. If you identify as an anxious attacher, head over to my Instagram or hit the link in my Instagram bio for my books. Okay. And you have a few books out. Yes. I have a few. Yeah. The so anxious I'm always Hearts working guide. on a new one. Yes. The anxious hearts yes. guide. That's, that's me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And hopefully through those, through those resources, Jimmy's TikTok page, my Instagram page and my books and this podcast, uh, we can all work on showing up the best, healthiest we can together. <laughs>